Turning to our next story, no tenure, no academic departments, and only degrees in engineering. That's just a little bit of what sets Olin College apart from other universities. The tiny Needham School opened in 2002 with the goal of transforming how colleges teach engineering. And to do that, says Olin, it starts with a different kind of student. Ten years since first opening its doors, Olin College is still not your typical engineering school. Case in point, a project where students are assigned to build robotic animals for fourth graders. My team built a bunch of dung beetles that could uh, play sort of a game that was similar to Hungry Hungry Hippos in structure. So my team's like, you know, you know what? We want to build an elephant. We want to build a rideable elephant that squirts water out its trunk. My group. Uh, believe it or not, actually made our monkey throw poop as its, its game. But it's not all fun and games at Olin. After all, U.S. News and World Report ranks it in the top 10 undergraduate engineering programs. And it got there with an unorthodox approach that robotics professor Andrew Bennett says better prepares students for the professional world. We expect them to engineer not just the technical details, but there are a lot of non-technical things that any real project is going to have. There'll be cost issues, there'll be schedule issues, there'll be use issues, uh, maintenance issues. This learning and doing approach starts when students are freshmen. And that puts real pressure on teachers to deliver, says mathematics professor Dr. John Geddes. If I come in late, they're already working. They're working on problems. They're talking to each other. They're working in groups. It's a very collaborative atmosphere. Geddes says this type of collaboration has taken him from the head of the class to side by side with students. I've spent very little time at the front of the classroom. I mostly spend my time chatting with students, helping them, redirecting them, mentoring them. Olin competes with the likes of Stanford and MIT for the country's top high school students. In fact, more than half of Olin's freshman class are national merit scholars and finalists. I visited MIT and then I visited Stanford and I was like, you know what, these places are awesome and there are really great academics everywhere, but uh, the people at Olin were just so incredibly happy to be here. And I'm like, I want to be that happy for the next four years. Olin's next big goal is to spread its philosophy to other campuses. So far, almost 200 universities have contacted Olin for advice, says Andrew Bennett. The larger schools can't always do what we can do. So I've been working with them to find ways of taking the critical parts and bring it into their curriculum. A philosophy that has taken Olin all the way to the bank. The school was recently awarded one of engineering's highest honors, a $500,000 prize from the National Academy of Engineering. And joining me now is Richard Miller, who is the president of Olin College. Welcome. Congratulations. Ten years. You were the first employee. That's pretty exciting. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. So when we started the uh, segment, we said a different kind of student. How are they different? Well, we're looking for people who are innovative, who are creative, who are passionate, who uh, want to be uh, people who invent the future. We don't think you can find them by looking at anything in writing, like a test score. So we interview every student at Olin. But you do have very high SAT scores. Yes. But, so it's, it's through the interview process. You were saying, well, if a kid says to me that he plays uh, video games on the side, that's not necessarily somebody you want. We're, we, everything, almost everything we do at Olin is team-based, and we think that uh, team-based learning, in fact, accelerates learning in many ways. So we're looking for people with multiple intelligences, and that includes uh, math and science ability, but it includes other things, too. It includes interpersonal intelligence, it includes creativity, the ability to envision things that have never been. I, I couldn't help but notice you have almost as many girls as boys, 46% mm -hmm. girls, 53% boys. I mean... <clears throat> Do you, do you seek that out? Do you seek that balance? Or does it just happen? Both. Uh, it, from the beginning, it's been a priority. Uh, we are looking for people who want to change the world. It's a very purpose-driven school. People are a very important element at Olin. Uh, our definition of engineering is that it starts with people and it ends with people. It's not just about things. And we also want to make a difference in the world. And I think this appeals to a lot of women. On the other hand, we're also preparing young people for life. So our first goal is to prepare, prepare them for life, and our secondary goal is to prepare them for a career. What kind of jobs do they get coming in here? Well, they get, um, the, the average starting salary for students last May was $82,000, really? I believe. 
Um, they work at lots of technology companies, but over the years, I believe s approximately 40% of them have gone on to graduate education. The bulk of them in science and engineering. Uh, lots of them go to the schools you know about, the Stanfords, the MITs, the Caltechs, the Berkeleys, and so mm -hmm. forth. But they don't all go into engineering. We had uh, quite a large percentage of our class last year that went directly to Harvard Business School. Some of them are going on to medicine and law. So there are lots of uh, outcomes. Mm -hmm. we, we really think of engineering as um, the new liberal arts. It's, it's a way that opens doors for you. Mm -hmm. So you got no tenure, no academic departments. Do you have regular classes? Do you have courses? But are they graded on the courses? Or? It's a very interesting question. When we began in the, uh, in the early years, in 2000, for example, it wasn't obvious that having courses was the right way to go. Uh, we do have courses, largely because it's important to uh, be able to modularize the curriculum mm -hmm. for pedagogical reasons. Um, but they're very different than uh, courses that you see in a lot of other places. So, for example, uh, students in our program have design as the core from the very beginning. When they first arrive, they start to design and make things. Uh, we believe that to engineer is to make, and every person has a need to do that, to express themselves. And it actually has an, a root that it maybe has more in common with the arts than it does with science. We believe that engineering is a process, not necessarily a body of knowledge, although it involves a body of knowledge. So we begin to teach the engineering process as soon as they arrive. So you used to be, which this is pretty stunning, pretty much tuition free. I mean, everybody had some kind of a scholarship mm -hmm. for tuition anyway, not necessarily room and board. But now it's about half scholarship. But I, but still, the tuition is forty one thousand dollars. So mm -hmm. it would be eighty two thousand if. They weren't on? No, the tuition is 41000 but every student gets a $20,000 scholarship. Okay. Um, so over the course of... How does that work? Of, Where does it come from? It's from the very large endowment that the Olin Foundation used to found the school. Uh, they believed that um, the way we teach engineering in this country needs to change. We need to open the doors and we need to welcome people in and we need to excite them and to create a different kind of engineer. And in order to create the pioneers to make that happen, we we're sort of looking for a few people who really have a passion to make a difference. And to make it possible for them, that we want to remove as many obstacles as possible. So to the maximum extent that we can, we try to take away the financial barriers too. So the economic crisis really of 08 made you say, hey, we, can't, we, just, we can't give full We couldn't sustain it forever to give full tuition after that. Um, we can sustain what we're doing now, and of course someday we hope we'll be in a position where we can restore everything, but that's going to take quite a while. So you have slightly under 1,000 kids? We have 350 students. Oh, that's very slightly under 1,000. Yeah. And you've got a great tuition, I mean, um, mm -hmm. great graduation rate. Mm -hmm. But the, the way to think about Olin, actually, is in a way it's a laboratory school. It was created by the Olin Foundation for a very specific purpose to become an important and constant contributor to the advancement of engineering education in America and throughout the world. And so in the first 10 years, we've built the laboratory. We have developed a proof of concept. There is a new way to teach that seems to uh, welcome women. It seems to produce very creative people who can do lots of different things. Now, in our next decade, we're going to look outward and to work with partnerships on other universities to help spread the ideas and to help spark innovation mm -hmm. in other environments. I thought you had some of that already with Babson and Wellesley. And well, we have a close partnership with our neighboring institutions that helps us uh, to educate our own students in a very broad way and to allow us to, um, to provide an engineering window on the world to students at Babson and at Wellesley. But f I'm thinking um, more about engineering schools on a very large scale. So one of our most mature partnerships is with the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. This is one of the largest state mm -hmm. universities in America that's quite different from Olin. Several years ago, they approached us and asked for advice on how they could rethink their undergraduate engineering program. And today, uh, they have uh, a program which was co-designed with folks at Olin uh, that affects all 1,500 incoming mm -hmm. first-year students each year, and we're about to enter into agreements with other universities. It's all very exciting. Congratulations again, and we'll be back here interviewing you 
for your 25th in 15 years. Mm -hmm. I might not be here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Richard Miller. Thank you. All right, and that is it for Greater Boston. To view my entire interview, by the way, with Mayor Menino, go to our website, wgbhnews.org. In the meantime, Adam Riley has a preview of what's coming up tomorrow on Beat the Press. Emily, tomorrow on Beat the Press, we're going to talk about how the local political media was thrown into a tizzy by this offhand comment from Governor Patrick. I intend to run for a third term as your governor. Now, for the record, the governor says that that was just a joke. Not everybody thought so, right, Adam? Thanks. We'll have that and more tomorrow on Beat the Press. I'm Emily Rooney. 